for Bergson was that first it was probable but impossible. This is how it was subjectively experienced. Then, when it happened, it suddenly became real and possible. That is to say, once it happened, it retroactively became totally acceptable, possible. And I, I think the subjective experience described here is quite, quite correct. I remember the same, for example, when I, the first weeks I have put were traumatic, when I did the military service. I uh, was there, and in advance I knew it would be terrifying, and I knew it would be horrible, but I somehow blocked it as a serious possibility. When I went to the army, it's not, the shock was not only that I was there, but how all of a sudden it was totally naturalized. Did it happen to you that I, it was on the contrary, already after a week or two that the life in the normal, non-military society became a kind of a vague memory and so on. So, uh, what happens here? That's the beautiful formula by Bergson, is that uh, there is the logic we have here is not the standard linear logic of a possibility of we have a situation A here which has certain possibilities this can happen, that can happen and so on then one of these possibilities is realized and so on and so on no, is that something that we consider here of course not logically but in the symbolic space impossible happens and when it happens it retroactively becomes possible in the sense that oh my god how couldn't we see it it's quite normal uh, 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 this would be incidentally the best definition you can imagine of what Jacques Lacan means an act you do something which appears impossible but it retroactively as it were creates its own conditions of possibility. I will give, even give you, so that you will not uh, 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 accuse me again of trying to do some communist propaganda or what, a very uh, common <coughs> example. You remember the Cold War, China so-so, sorry, Russia so-so in Nixon era, but Mao's China, total madness, they want world war. Then Nixon's visit to China. How? When it happened, it immediately looked normal. Of course, no break, of course, it's rational politics, and so on, and so on, and so on. So, uh, here is another beautiful quote from Bergson, where he accounts for this mechanism. He says, I never pretended that one can insert reality into the past and thus work backwards in time. However, one can, without any doubt, insert there the possible, or rather, at every moment, the possible inserts itself there. Insofar as unpredictable and new reality creates itself, its image reflects itself behind itself in the indefinite past. This new reality finds itself all the time having been possible. But it is only at the precise moment of its actual emergence that it begins to always already have been. That's the wonderful formulation. And this is why I say that its possibility, which does not precede its reality, will have preceded it once this reality emerges. You know, it's like, it's like this... Uh, uh, how to put it? it? Sorry, immediately, just to finish the life. I'm senile old, just to finish. It's like, you know, when you are in love. You are in love and then somehow, all of a sudden, it appears as if all your previous life is structured as if it was waiting for this moment. Please. Where did you quote from? Ah, good idea. It, the, quote, uh, the quote is... Uh, was it here or there? I will give you the precise quote. Uh, uh, for? Yeah, I quote from uh, I quote from from uh, I wanted to be precise from oeuvre blah blah blah, but basically it's from his text. It should be translated. It was one of his big texts. Two sources of morality and religion. 
And if I know it correctly, it's not a mega thick book, so it should be easy to... All I know is that my official quote is from Oeuvre. Works, you know, this Pleiad crazy edition in one volume, page 1110 and 11. But that's not realistic. Look into, look into that one. Uh, uh, but but uh, to admit, but where I really quote from, I don't bluff with you. I uh, tell you openly, is, as always intellectuals do it, I am really quoting from that wonderful, I forgot which one, Jean-Pierre Dupuy, whom I mentioned to you yesterday. He is this uh, wonderful uh, uh, rational choice theorist, but with a great dialectical sense. For example, he has a, a wonderful theory of how you should confront a catastrophe. That uh, it doesn't work if you say, okay, there is still a possibility. You say, you must accept catastrophe as inevitable and then change the very past so that, you know, like, you must work in this, uh, in this way. So what, I'm, so what has this to do with, ah, now we go to the crucial point, what has this to do with Hegel? I claim that uh, 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 what the Hegelian temporality, when Hegel speaks about rational totality and so on and so on, is uh, when he Hegel speaks about eternity. It's always done in this way. It's not, for, for example, you know, you have all these formulas in Hegel, which may sound like this absolute metaphysical closure, where the atemporal structure has priority over temporal development. Hegel does say, for example, uh, in development, a thing becomes what it always already was. As if, you know, in previous... So, as if we have a closed circle of potentials, possibilities, and this effectively, Hegel may appear to be this kind of a totally closed structure. But I think the way we should read the Hegelian notion of totality is more in this Bergson way, and I will give you here, let's proceed a little bit fast so that... Uh, uh, we don't lose time. You must know, again, the conservatives that I like. There is another Deleuze's notion which is crucial here. It's the strange notion of what Deleuze calls a pure past. An absolute past, a kind of a atemporal, eternal texture where, quote from Deleuze, uh, where all events, include, including those that have sunk without trace, are stored and remember as they're passing away, and so on and so on. So again, this idea that whatever goes on just realizes what potentially is always already there in an atemporal structure. But is Hegel really saying this? I think Hegel is effectively saying something much closer to, I will not quote it to you, you must know it, a wonderful passage, I like conservatives again, from T.S. Eliot, you know that, traditional mm -hmm. individual talent. You know, when he has this idea that every truly new work of art retroactively changes the past itself. Of course, he's not an idiot. Like Bergson, his point is not that the magic travel in the past, but that for example, I don't know how to put it, after a certain new work of art, classical arts themselves are structured, perceived in a different way. The idea is here what in structuralism it was called the priority of synchrony over diachrony, in the sense that at every historical moment we don't have just the present. The present is always also the entire past, the way it forms what Deleuze calls this virtual pure past. All the traces, the way they are structured. So again, this is how we should distinguish common changes and a true radical change. Common changes just explore possibilities within this structure of the past. A radical change restructures, in this sense, the past itself. How does this work? Again, uh, let me give you...